Hello lovely people, I am back for the second part of my November reading wrap up which is all of the fiction that I read. I did my non-fiction November wrap up as a separate video just because I thought for this month it might be quite good to just separate them out. Um, but yeah, I didn't read that much fiction so hopefully this won't be too long but I thought I would just dive in and have a little chat about what I did pick up. The first book I want to talk about is The Inugami Curse by Seishi Yokomizo. I have forgotten off the top of my head who the translator was but I will put it in the description down below. This is the second Seishi Yokomizo book that I have read so far and I have a third of his to read. I was really interested in reading this because he's a very famous Japanese crime writer um, he's having a bit of a moment right now because I, I can't remember the publisher but some publisher has translated some of his works into English and they're being published in English for the first time and so I've seen quite a few people picking up some of his. Um, I was interested in reading The Inugami Curse because The Honjin Murders, which was the first one of his I wrote, I found the sort of narrative construction interesting and I wanted to like compare the two. Um, and they were, in some ways there were similarities, but in other ways there were some interesting details that I quite enjoyed. So the concept of the Inugami curse is that um, the head of this clan has died and it's the reading of the will and essentially the, the reading of the will is very contentious and not a lot of people are happy with the rules that are in place because they are a little bit... Um, they are complex and depending on what uh, happens different people will get different amounts of things and there's just a lot of family unhappiness and in the result of this will reading um, people start to be picked off and our little detective guy is sort of like trying to figure out what's going on. I found in a similarity to the Honjin murders the narration style of this means that there is sort of a little bit of a distance from the characters for me at times but it's, it's kind of all about the construction so again like I felt that there was like less referencing to other murder mysteries like there was in the Honjin murders the Honjin murders seemed very self-aware of itself as a constructed mystery this one I definitely still felt like there's this, there's this whole thing with the construction of these murder mysteries where I I actually did predict some stuff to do with the reveal of this one whereas with the Honjin murders I was like I've got no fucking clue babe and I don't know how anyone could ever solve that one themselves so it's it's like one of those where it's like it's not really about the characterization for me it's not really about being able to guess the mystery it's kind of just about seeing how it's constructed and how it plays out I'm just really enjoying like murder mysteries as narrative constructions and engaging with genre and that kind of thing so it definitely like delivered for me on that front I will say this one I definitely felt like how it was dated in some ways particularly when it's talking about people with physical disabilities or mental disabilities um and I did enjoy it. Uh, they are quite grisly. <laughs> I think what I'm feeling is that I am enjoying reading Seishi Okamizo. I think I will read the third one. I'm not sure if I will buy many more after that. I don't know. But I'd really love to hear your thoughts if you've been reading him because I, f I feel like I see lots of mixed opinions. And yeah. After that, I want to talk about a DNF. <laughs> this is. Royal Assassin by Robin Hogg. I've been buddy reading this series with my friend. We started buddy reading this like months ago and then like we haven't read it for like a whole month. This is tricky because I know that Robin Hogg is very beloved and I think maybe that I, I had very high expectations because everyone loves this series and if you love this series that's absolutely fine I'm not critiquing you. It's just I've gone into this with the awareness that like everyone loves it and it's not really been working for me personally. <laughs> I think the thing is, is it's very slow paced. So with this second book, initially at the start, I was really enjoying it because I was, we were finding out more details and I really enjoy that aspect. Um, by this point, we're, we're following Fitz, who is the bastard child of um, the guy who was next in line for the there's this thing called the skill which is kind of like an ability that this family has that they can like impel people and do like not magic but kind of magic and then there's this different thing called the wit which involves um interaction with animals and Fitz has both and he also like is kind of he's being trained as this like assassin for the royal family but 
I think my I, our main thing with this is this is told in a very slow paced manner and that works for a lot of people and it does work for me at times where I've been struggling with this one is I don't care about Fitz and Molly I don't want to read any more about Molly I just don't care and I keep having it where like there are interesting things in this series but they're just so wrapped up in so much excess detail that I I just can't always be bothered to get to the interesting things. So when I'm reading this with my friend, I am having fun. And we send each other little voice messages and it's good. And then we just didn't pick it up for a month. And then we were like met up and we were like, do you want to just read a different book? So what I did is I read the plot summary of this book because there is a very thorough wiki for Robin Hobb books. And when I read the plot summary, I get it. Like, that plot, I see why people are, like, hooked. I just cannot be bothered to wade through all of this to get there. However, I do own The Live Ship. I forget what the first book is called, but the first book of The Live Ship Chronicles on my Kindle. So, a Wikipedia plot summary the the rest of this trilogy. And then I'm going to try that book. And see if I get on better because I don't like Fitz as a narrator. <laughs> I find him really annoying. So I thought maybe if I read the next series I could see and then maybe continue it from there. We'll see. Um, but yeah, just wanted to mention that I've given up on that one. Um, I also picked up Poems Old and New selected by A.S. Carncross. This is a little poetry collection. Um, I mentioned in my October wrap up that my grandma passed away in October. Um, I've been helping my mum go through her stuff and um, I've, I've taken some books that I thought seemed like books that I would be interested in. And I've been, it's been really lovely actually. I've been really viewing it as a way of like keeping close to my gran and all of that, which is really nice. Um, and so I picked up a couple of poetry collections because they all have lots of little things in and I'm really interested to see which poems like spoke to my gran and one thing that was lovely about this is that like loads of the ones that she's bookmarked are poems that are like really important to me but they've not come to me through her like I don't know the lady of Shalott or the highwayman um and like stuff like that and I was it, it's really sweet to see because there, there are poems which have come to me through my mum, which came to her through my gran. Walter Delamere and stuff like this, like very much like that is from my gran. But it's really interesting to see that we are both drawn to these same poems independently of each other. Um, so that was really lovely. This, I really enjoyed this collection actually, because um, it just had a selection that I really liked. I particularly enjoyed the first section, which was ballads. And I was like, ooh, apparently I'm a ballad girl which I, I feel like I should have known about myself. Um, but yeah, just like there's just like a lot of really classic poems in this that I already knew that I liked, like Goblin Market. And like, I don't know, let's find any others, like, oh, Captain, my Captain, The Lake Isle of Innisfree, like stuff like that. I already knew I liked those poems, but it also did introduce me to a bunch of poems that I had not previously known that I have really enjoyed reading. So this was just like, I don't even know if this is in print anymore. It, there, I'm like one of two people on Goodreads who's engaged with this book. So gonna go out on a limb and say maybe hard to get your hands on but I did really enjoy the selection and more than that I really enjoyed connecting to my gran through it. Um, a book that I picked up because of one of my non-fiction November reads so I read Hidden Hands which is all about the lives of manuscripts and their makers and she talked about the Exeter Riddle book so obviously I decided to finally read the Exeter Riddle book. This is a Folio Society edition that I have, which is lovely. This is translated by Kevin Crosley Holland. I have engaged with the Exeter Riddle book before because I did an old English literature module when I was at university and we studied some of the riddles, but I have never just like worked my way through the book. And so I did that in like little dips and drabs and it was really fun. So the introduction was really interesting. The poems are all formatted like this and there's like an image which is like kind of, a clue to the solution or like what we think the solution might be and then there are notes in the back because not all of the riddles we know the answer for so the notes at the back are very much expanding upon them and being like these are all the theories people have I loved the ones where it was literally like we have no idea we don't know what this means this feels like nonsense um that was just really fun so this was really fun I really liked trying to figure them out um 
Kevin Crossley Holland talks about in the introduction that like riddles were a great way of like imparting knowledge to people because there's nothing like the experience of going oh to make you remember information because your brain goes oh I missed all of that and then it holds on to it and then if you were to do it again you'd be like oh it's an egg or you know whatever um but so yeah this was a really fun like little process I read some of these aloud to my partner and was like can you guess um and I really enjoyed that so this was just like a really I've been meaning to do this for a while so I'm glad that I finally did and yes there's nothing like doing a riddle to make you connect to like people who lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago and to be like yeah we're both stumped by this and we both will have gone oh, when the answer was revealed like you know just like the passage of time man wow uh, the final book I'm going to talk about is Return of the King which is I have been doing a Lord of the Rings reread I reread Two Towers this time last year in 2021 um and essentially I caught COVID at the end of November and before I realised I had COVID when I just felt terrible I was like you know what this calls for this calls for the comfort of Lord of the Rings so at that point I decided to reread Return of the King what happened is I had a fever for multiple days and I was a bit delirious and I had a really intense but lovely time <laughs> and also adding on to that um horrible timing catching covid when i did meant that i had to miss my grand's funeral so it was quite emotional that week and i just kind of wept <laughs> over quite a large amount of return of the king it was just me crying and being like am i crying because i'm sad about my life or am i crying because i'm like so emotionally invested in lord of the rings and the answer was kind of both and what happened is while i was feverish I decided that it was very important that I took notes and so I just thought I'm not going to do a proper re review because I've already talked about it on my channel and I'll find that video and I'll stick it down below. I thought I would just talk about what I found noteworthy enough to write down while slightly delirious. This began with, um, and this is a, a valid point, I had not noticed the first time I read Return of the King how the paralleling of Merry and Pippin opens the novel. Like, chapter one, we have Pippin going to Gondor and, like, pledging himself. And then chapter two, we have Merry, like, pledging himself to Theoden. And what I found really interesting about this is not only is it like, oh, bless your sweet hobbits, you're separated, but you're still, like, linked in this journey that you're going on. Um, it's an interesting perspective to be exploring, like, the outbreak of war from as well, because the hobbits have such limited, like, information, you know, like, it's not having Gandalf talk you through it, who knows all the intricacies, you're just kind of seeing Pippin, like, half the time he's running around with a little kid, and then half the time he, like, happens to be eavesdropping on really important conversations, but also, I felt like it did such a good job of highlighting the differences between Denethor and Theoden so well, like, the hobbits pledge themselves but in the manner of the pledging and the reception of the pledging you can read so much about those two figures they're both powerful they both have been manipulated by Sauron Theoden has come out the other side of it Denethor still very much like in it kind of um you know and the coldness with which Pippin's pledging is received almost like like I find Denethor interesting because he he obviously he's not not great guy but like very much like he's been looking in that little orb for a long time there's been a long time for him to be corrupted and um there is this time like he like his interactions like you're like are you mocking are you like there's this is unsure footing with him um so then you parallel that to the way that mary pledges himself to theoden and theoden is like i will be like a father to you and like for me it really highlights this sort of way that Theoden is like this idealized ruler in this way because in contrast to Denethor because Theoden is he kind of embodies that like Anglo-Saxon ideal of your lord and it's like you pledge yourself to the lord and the lord in turn provides you he's like a father to you he provides you with the shelter of the hall he provides you with food and mead on dark nights you have companionship you're part of this band versus like a bad lord who doesn't provide for his soldiers i don't know it felt like everything with theoden and the riders of rohan to me feels very saxon and those um concepts that are in like 
you know, old English poems like the Battle of Malden and like the Wanderer and that kind of thing. Like it really, and I know that those are Tolkien's inspirations and I know it's probably deliberate. It's just like, it really, like just from the opening chapters, I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I see it. <laughs> I also could not stop thinking about how absolutely wild it is. It would have been because like the, the Eowyn, like Durnheld reveal, like I should have said, there'll be such spoilers here. Um, I feel like now, especially because of the films, there is a cultural presence of Lord of the Rings. So, like, even if you've not, like, read the books or, or seen the films, like, you probably have some ideas about some things. So when I read the book, like, I knew that it was going to be Eowyn. Um, but I was just thinking about, like, how wild. Like, you have this guy, Durnheld, and he just, like, picks up Mary and he's like, I'll take you if you want to go. And, like, doesn't really interact with the rest of the riders. And you're like, ooh, like very much vibes of like Strider in the pub you know like way back in book one like ooh, who is this mysterious rider man and then you're like psych it's Eowyn it's her it's like I was just like I can't even comprehend how much that would have blown my mind if I'd have read that without knowing I'd have just been like what on earth this is so cool um <laughs> I was also thinking about the linguistics because, oh, I should have said, I read Babel in uh, November, but I'm not going to talk about it because HarperCollins Union are still on strike and they've asked people to not review HarperCollins books as a sign of support. Um, I will, however, link to their official Twitter down below so you can follow them and find out other ways that you can support them. As of recording, the strike is still ongoing. I'm not going to talk about this until it's done. However, I will just mention that I read it because and therefore linguistics were on the mind. And then I was thinking about Tolkien's linguistics and languages. And like, I don't even, I've not even dabbled in that. Like there is gonna be so many writings online about the linguistic influences and I get that, I've not gone there. But I was just thinking about, for example, Minas Tirith. Um, Dinas is the Welsh word for, I believe, like a town, a, oh God, it's like a town, but also like, on a mountain or a hill. It was fresher in my mind when I wrote this note. And I was just thinking about the connection and I was like, I wonder if you got it from there. I wonder if that's the linguistic root. Someone who has knowledge will probably let me know. But anyway, then we skip ahead to Theoden's speech. And I literally just wrote out the speech. <laughs> I just wrote it out. Fell deeds awake. Fire and slaughter. Like the whole speech. And I, not only did I write it out, but I, in the depths of COVID, performed it for my partner. Just like gave a live reading of the speech. Um, and then I just wrote at the end of it, I weep. <laughs> what should say? And then I also wrote, language so so evocative of old English poetry slash translations. Because it did. Um, and then I wrote in full caps, actual chills at Eowyn's reveal um because yes I also wrote down the quotation and after war he brought healing because I think that that's a really interesting part of Aragorn's character is that like the sign that he is the true king is that he has hands of healing and what that says to you about the narrative of this book and how it is all war but the person who is like essentially our highest ideal of a person has hands of healing and what that means I was just like, oh, it got me in the emotions. And then I also wrote down um, what Mary said about Theoden, for he was a gentle man. And I was like, I got really sad about Theoden on this reread, I have to say. Um, if you're wondering why I didn't write any notes about the Frodo Sam side of this story, it is because for quite a large amount of it, I just cried. <laughs> I like, I find the bit when Sam is like saving Frodo from the orcs like really funny because it's like he just finds him because he's singing. Of course. Um, uh, it's just, and I was, I was like really, really enjoying it. It's just pretty much from the time they reached, from the time Sam starts like giving all of his food to Frodo and they're like going towards Mount Doom and they have no expectation of making the return journey. Like, I just cried and then like I do not choose to do what I came here to do and then I'm glad that you're here with me here at the end of all things I just cried <laughs> I just got really I was like already emotional and then I just like feverish crying reading Return of the King that was the end of my November I'm gonna stop talking about it here because I'm just waffling at you but suffice to say I had a great time reading Lord of the Rings 
I want to read The Silmarillion in 2023. That is a mission I am setting myself. Um, I would love to hear if, if you have any Lord of the Rings feelings. What makes you cry when you read it? Or just like any thoughts on any of these books, very welcome. Please do let me know. Uh, or just like what nice fiction things did you read and remember? All of that would be very welcome to hear. I am going to stop talking now because I am still a little bit recovering from the COVID and I can't breathe very well. So I hope you have a lovely day. I will see you next time for something different. And in the meantime, just have a good life.